thank you everyone for joining us on this Saturday, uh, which is a very special Saturday out of the year, World Fish Migration Day. My name is Anthony Allen. I am the Assistant Director of Ecological Restoration at Save the Sound. And this is a very special session to celebrate World Fish Migration Day. It happens once a year, and it is today, October 24th. And we'll get a little bit more into what that means as, as I go here. But uh, our format today is, is really pretty exciting. Um, we're going to, uh, we're going to be going through several, three to be precise, of our project sites where fish passage has been or will be restored uh, by through the work of our ecological restoration team and uh, partners. So several members of our ecological restoration team are on the line right now and they're stationed at different locations and I'll, I'll, we'll be throwing it to them in the field uh, at various points. And I did see in chat, uh, yes, please do throw into chat for us if you'd like uh, where, you're, where you're dialing in from and perhaps what organization you're with. And, you know, as a fun little icebreaker, if you have a favorite fish passage project, go ahead and put that in there too. So, uh, all right. Thank you for that reminder. Okay. So for those of you who are less familiar with Save the Sound and our work, we are a regional leader in environmental action across the Long Island Sound region. That means Connecticut and New York, all of the watersheds that drain into Long Island Sound. So we do this in a number of ways. We have four main program areas that allow us to uh, protect endangered or threatened lands, ensure water quality uh, in the sound and its rivers, uh, fight climate change and uh, lead advocacy uh, for climate positive um, solutions and work with nature to restore ecosystems. That is sort of the focus of uh, this session today is our restoration program. So ecological restoration is really, uh, what, what we mean by that is we are working with nature to restore the conditions for thriving. So it doesn't mean that we're going in and we're fixing ecosystems, right? It means most often that there has been some degradation or some impediment to natural system functioning, uh, usually man-made or often man-made uh, or as a result of climate change um, that we really want to reverse and we want to remove those impediments and give nature the chance to come back. And what we find so often is that nature is incredibly resilient and does rebound. And you'll see an example of that today. So World Fish Migration Day, all around the world today, and, and this is truly global, all around the world today, there are events like this and every other iteration you can imagine to celebrate fish migration. And it's this great time of year, this great opportunity for us to draw attention to the importance of these very small fish, right? And one you see in the bottom right hand of the screen there, that's an alewife. That's one of the species that here in the Northeast we focus a lot on. Uh, it's, it's what we refer to as a forage fish. And in addition to other ecosystem functions, it is prey for just about everything you can imagine. Uh, John uh, Vanderwerf, our fish biologist who's on the line today, often says that uh, everything eats alewife. And that is a big part of, of their ecosystem function. Uh, in addition to nutrient transport, you know, when they, they come upriver and they spawn in our rivers and our freshwater uh, ecosystems, and then the young will migrate out to Long Island Sound and to the Atlantic Ocean where they, they live and they grow, and then they'll migrate back up to uh, begin the cycle again. So that's one example of what we refer to as diadromous fish. Uh, meaning essentially that's what we mean when we say migratory fish. Um, and they're an example of anadromous fish, right? So they spawn in freshwater and then they move out and, and grow up and live most of their lives in uh, brackish or saltwater marine ecosystems. Whereas catadromous, something like an American eel, 
right? They, they spawn in the Atlantic and then uh, the young come up into our rivers and they live in freshwater ecosystems before going back out to, uh, to reproduce in saltwater. So they're incredibly important and we just wanna celebrate some of the, the ways in which their populations have been restored. Over the years, they were decimated by things like dam construction, overfishing, water pollution. Uh, it, it really, uh, their, their populations used to be very, very abundant in this region and they've plunged. And with it, you know, sort of the larger species that prey on them uh, have also taken a hit. And so now a, a lot of the work that we do on, around fish migration, we focus on these alewives, these river herring uh, and, and other forage fish species to bring them back and uh, recognize the role that they play. So thank you for joining us to celebrate this World Fish Migration Day. And so what we're gonna be doing today is we're going to throw it out to a couple of these that you see the arrows on here. So this is this is our whole organization's impact map, uh, right? Uh, just a smattering of the different projects and the things that we're working on across those four program areas I mentioned. Um, the yellow arrows are pointing to all of our fish passage projects um, from from recent memory. These are all within the last uh, ten years here. And so if you look. Um, Let's see if I can if I can point out. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but um, the one that's closest to New Haven proper uh, is uh, on the Farm River, and that's at Pages Mill Pond Dam. That was our most recently completed project. So uh, we'll we'll go out there to Alex Croft uh, during the, the session today. Um, also not shown here because there's just too much work that's going on in the New Haven area. But over on, on, the, on the West River, uh, where we've done so much work, was Pages Mill Pond, or sorry, not Pages, Pond Lily Dam, excuse me, Pond Lily Dam, uh, which was a very, very significant removal, uh, uh, big project. And so we'll go out there to John Vanderwerf. And uh, finally, we have um, way out here towards the Western part of the state on the Norwalk River, that is Dana Dam, otherwise known as Strong Pond Dam on the Norwalk River at Merwin Meadows Park. And uh, Gwen McDonald is out there. So let's dig into this here. So first up, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about Pond Lily Dam. And I don't know, I don't think uh, any of them are on the line today. Let us know if you are, but um, Gather New Haven, which at that time was was known as the New Haven Land Trust, was the owner of this dam. It sits, it sat uh, at their Pond Lily Nature Preserve property. And what you see in this picture is the before, right? You can see this big dam. There was a, a fishway that was built at one point that uh, was not functioning uh, and, and just was not, was not doing uh, as good a job as we'd like. And this dam, I, I don't think this picture even captures the full extent. It was a long dam. It was a very significant dam. And so you can see Pond Lily, which is where it got its name, up behind it. That's the, what we call the impoundment area um, of the dam. So you can see over on the map here that uh, this was part of a series of projects which have happened and actually are ongoing for us on the West River, uh, beginning with the tide gates. And if you've ever seen tide gates, tide gates are installed to control the tidal signature and the flow of salt water into uh, uh, rivers and floodplain. This can be done for a number of reasons, but it, one thing that it does do is it, it blocks fish passage or it makes it very, very difficult. And so in 2012, several of those tide gates were replaced with self-regulating tide gates, which allow for fish passage to occur as well as uh, saltwater signature and, and tidal signature. So upriver from that then, it made sense to remove Pond Lily Dam. Um, and so that was, that was completed back in 2015. And there was a, a remarkable number of partners on this project. I mean, first and foremost, of course, New Haven Land Trust, now known as Gather New Haven, 
who still maintains that site and, and who we work with closely, but also, uh, you know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Restore America's Estuaries, NOAA, City of New Haven, the Town of Woodbridge, Solar Youth, Common Ground High School, the Connecticut uh, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, and uh, ACA, ACFHP, which is American Atlantic Coast fish habitat, I'm going to mess that up. Uh, there's too many, too many alphabets here. Um, but this was a very, very significant project. And so what you see now, let that sink into your mind for a second, because right now I'm actually going to stop sharing. And we're going to go out to John Vanderwerf at Pond Lily right now. Uh, to give us a look at what that site, that same site looks like today. Over to you, John. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Anthony, for this opportunity to share one of my favorite uh, research sites. So here you can see I'm standing in the middle of the river, actually right where the Pond Lily d uh, Dam actually was standing. So you can see I'm in the river here. It's nice and vegetated behind me. And actually behind me going that way is where the dam was standing. This was a really, really special dam removal um, for multiple different reasons. One of the major reasons is it started um, allowing diadromous fish further upstream from where their first barrier was at the tide gates. Now they're moving all the way up into a 76 acre pond, which is almost perfect spawning habitat for them and Knoll's Pond upstream. So this dam removal um, restored passage to over two miles of stream and around 76 acres of ponded habitat for these fish to grow up and spawn in. So this dam removal is a really special site. I'm flip the camera here so you can see a little bit and better. It is a beautiful riffle here now, nice vegetated banks. You can see the vegetation in only a couple of years is really, really dense. And the river is really looking much better and much more beautiful now that there is no dam here. So we have been seeing with the surveys we've been conducting since uh, 2017, we've been seeing a abundance of American eel from really small, right above glass eel size from under six inches all the way up to over 12 inches, almost the size of your arm and huge adults getting ready to migrate back out towards the Atlantic to the Sargasso Sea. So we're seeing multiple age classes of eels now through this river. So it's safe to say that it's no longer a barrier because eels are moving in and out with minimal um, issues. Um, they are able to climb over dams when they are there, but now that we're seeing the multiple age classes, it's giving indication that they're moving freely in and out of this river instead of having a barrier that they're fighting to move over. On top of that, this year was a really exciting year for the alewife run. There was 50 fish caught this year in the trap where we trapped, which was the highest number we've had to date since the dam was pulled down. So that was a really exciting uh, event this year. And also we got our first live sea lamprey in the trap. Last year we had one that was caught and captured, but a snapping turtle got to the trap before I was able to and made lunch out of the sea lamprey. So this year we got a live one that was really exciting. Alex Crofta, who you'll hear from the field, was able to survey that. Um, so that was a really exciting thing. And on top of sea lamprey news, we also surveyed during a, our low flow summer surveys, sea lamprey amicete. So young sea lamprey using um, the upstream riffle that was engineered and constructed, they're using that as nursery habitat to grow. So that was another really exciting um, finding from the field here. And that in itself is incredible for World Fish Migration Day that there's more than uh, one species of fish now migrating through and also utilizing this restored habitat. Um, on top of that, I'll flip and I'll show you a little bit about the vegetation. I'll walk through. It is very dense and growing very robustly. There's been multiple um, field trips through conferences here where multiple wetland scientists are all excited about how high the Joe Pie weed is and how dense the cottonwoods and how really robust the vegetation is growing here. 
So with the vegetation, that gave a really great opportunity to get community involvement. Um, one of the really special things about this pond lily dam removal site is that it's kind of in the center of New Haven, right on Whaley Avenue. There's uh, apartments and there's buildings and there's a big Walgreens here behind us. So this property opened up green space and is allowing the community to come in and see some really impressive things with vegetation. There's also been incredible birds and pollinator species here, which a couple different groups have been monitoring. So this site has opened up a lot of opportunities for the community to come into green spaces and see this really impressive vegetation that you can see 360 around me in the middle of New Haven is really impressive. There's also a trail system here that's pretty actively used. And like I mentioned, there's multiple organizations doing different studies here. There's a pollinator study going on. Um, so with that, on top of World Fish Migration Day, this site has worked out really nicely for birds migrating and using this as a stopover spot. And also as a pollinator pathways, there are incredible wildflowers here that bloom. And it's very abundant that uh, there's incredible insect life here. And this site is really incredible. And one of my favorite research sites. So thank you for the opportunity to share it. And I hope you found a little bit about this site interesting. Thanks, John. And I wonder if uh, before, before, you, you, uh, before I pick it back up, if you can say just a little bit about how we, uh, like how we trap and how we research, uh, you know, how you do your monitoring at this site. And absolutely, and, yeah. Yeah, so the, the spring uh, alewife trapping is done upstream of this site. We set up a big, big large scale minnow trap that blocks most of the river. So anything, any fish moving upstream through this dam removal site, make it all the way through the dam removal site so we can definitively say, yes, we are not affecting the fish. We, they are now able to move completely through it um, and they get stuck in this trap. And then six times a week, I go out and I check the trap and make sure there's no mortalities. Everything is alive. Everything is released immediately upstream of the trap to not wreck their migration, to not impede anything. We're just using it as an estimator of how many fish move through the site year to year in the run. Everything is documented and coordinated very um, closely with the state of Connecticut DEP uh, and we also work very closely with State Deep to do the summer low flow monitoring, which we do uh, electro fishing, which is a the most humane way to uh, survey fish. We put an electrical current into the water. It electrocutes them to sleep, which doesn't harm them at all. And within seconds, once they're out of the electrical field, they wake, back, they wake right back up and are free. And we, we measure them, identify them, get numbers and measurements to see um, kind of the community that's in the river. See how many fish, what species of fish, whether the fish like a river environment or a lake environment. And that's part of the way we can say, yes, we're making a positive impact in this river because now the river fish who prefer to be in rivers are now inhabiting this area. Um, the vegetation surveys, we're also looking, um, there's almost 40 sites in a grid going across this impoundment or former impoundment. And we're looking at Again, community, so we're trying to get an identification on every plant that's here and see if it's native, invasive, and then also its wetland indicator status so to see if we're having a net positive or a negative on the wetland around the impoundment. And right now we're seeing the great majority of the plants that are here in the former impoundment are overwhelmingly native. And also we're having a overwhelming majority still being wetland plants. Um, there are a few invasives thrown through, but as you'd expect in a disturbed site in a relatively um, developed uh, landscape in the surrounding area. But the fishery surveys we're seeing, the majority are riverine fish, native fish, and we're seeing that the fish population is increasing and that the uh, biodiversity of the fish is also increasing as well. And we're getting more and more species of fish each year and more overwhelmingly riverine species on top of that. Great. Thanks, John. And, and I do see uh, there's a question in here, but I think I may save that 
and sort of uh, talk about that across all three sites in terms of uh, pollution monitoring and any pollution monitoring. So thank Great. you, John. And uh, yeah, thank I'm, you. Gonna, I'm gonna go ahead back in. So uh, we're back into the into the uh, presentation now and we're gonna move to the next site. All right, so this is Page's Mill Pond Dam, which you see in the picture here as well. Again, this is a before photo and this is a completed project. So we're excited to show you live in just a moment what it looks like uh, today. But this is this was a, a, a unique project because uh, we actually did a fishway here, right? And generally speaking for fish passage and for fish migration and also for other ecosystem benefits, we prefer removals. Removals uh, allow passage for all migratory species, whereas fishway, uh, while several species typically can use them, they're designed for one species in particular most times. And so in this case, it was designed for alewife. Um, other species have already been seen using it, like white sucker. Um, and there was a, 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 an elevator put in that, that uh, Alex will probably, hopefully, be able to show you what that what that looks like to allow eel to, to to use the passage as well. But a little bit about the context for this site and why sort of a, a fishway actually made sense here and why we felt we felt okay about doing it and felt good about doing it, it has a lot to do with uh, the dam owner. So uh, the Suter family, uh, this is private property and the Suter family owns this dam and uh, he, uh, Lindsay Suter is an architect and they are very engaged and very committed to the maintenance of this dam and the maintenance of the fishway. So that's a very unique thing. We don't often find that uh, with sites. Normally uh, dams are sort of derelict and not well taken care for if owners even know they're there. Obviously this one's fairly obvious. Um, and it, it, it actually is going to allow us, because of a partnership with uh, the local Trout Unlimited chapter, to and, and with DEEP, to monitor this fishway and monitor what species are using it and keep an eye on, on sort of the efficacy of it and allow that to inform other projects. So this really was a unique site in very many ways. And we're excited about the way it turned out. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. You can see on, uh, on the map here that it was not the first barrier, right? So there was another dam downstream of this one, which uh, the Regional Water Authority, who is one of the partners on this project, uh, and, and this project has been in the works for over a decade, right? And this dam's been here for 323 years <laughs> for context, but the, the project's been in the works for, for a decade. and uh, the downstream dam uh, had a fishway built in 2014. That's a much lower dam. It allowed fish to come up uh, and reach this uh, barrier. And so then the, the, next, the next obstacle was Page's Mill Pond Dam. And now they can get up and over that too. So after this, there's no barrier on the Farm River. Sorry, this is the Farm River right on sort of the line between uh, East Haven and Branford, and uh, this site is in North Branford. So going up to the final barrier, North Branford Dam, that has been determined by Deep Inland Fisheries Division to not be historically significant habitat, what's upstream of that, has been determined to be not significant, historically significant habitat for alewife migratory fish. So uh, this was a huge project because now it means that for all the historical habitat, alewife now have access to that once again. So without further ado, I'm gonna throw it out. Hold on, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm gonna ask Alex Crofta, who's our ecological restoration projects manager to show us around Pages Mill Pond and the fishway that's there. Thanks, Anthony. Um, hope you all can hear me all right. I'm standing at the base of this dam, which was 
the obstacle to fish migration for about 300 years. They would hit this, the bottom of this dam, and that was it for, um, for their trip to their spawning grounds. Um, so until, until May of this year, that was the case. And now I'm gonna show you um, the fish ladder that's been constructed here. So the fish will come along, they, they, they're attracted to the flow of the water uh, coming over the dam. And then normally the fish, well, the fishway has water in it. Um, right now it's shut down for the season because it's not, um, fish are not migrating at this stage. So, but normally water will be pouring out of this uh, entrance structure. So they'll be attracted to this. They'll swim through this little entrance pool. And then this is the fish ladder itself that they are gonna uh, swim up. And I'm gonna walk up as though I were a fish. Uh, swimming up this fish ladder. Um, so this is the first stretch of the of the steep pass fishway is 20 feet long and they swim up and then they get into the resting pool. So this is a flat structure um, without uh, a whole lot of flow moving through it. And then, you know, and as I said, during uh, the fish runs, the water will be higher. It'll be up to sort of that level of that uh, brown, that brown mark. And the way that the, these um, these uh, fish ladders or fish ways work is there's a series of baffles and veins that uh, change how the water flows. They create a lot of turbulence that allows the fish to, um, even though that's a pretty steep grade, allows them to get up um, up this structure and uh, forward. So I'm going to keep walking up here. So this is the next little section. Uh, this is about 15 feet of uh, steep pass fishway. So the fish will move up through here. And then again, they're reaching another concrete channel that's, uh, it will have water moving through it. Again, much higher during the fish run, um, but not as uh, challenging to move through as those, um, those inclined steep pass units. So then moving along, here's the, um, the stop planks, which are used to uh, shut down the fishway when when fish are not migrating through. Uh, those are just oak boards that are slid into place in these grooves that are set into the channel. Um, Anthony had mentioned the eel pass, which is just this, the elevator, which is this tube um, that water is allowed to move through. Uh, the, entrance, the tube enters the channel here, down below that water, um, and then flows down uh, towards the entrance structure of the fishway. Uh, that tube is filled with um, plastic chains, which slow down the water and allow the, the young eel um, to have sort of surface area to use to climb up. So then they move up through that tube and then into this channel, and then they can move forward. Um, again, moving upstream. So here's a series of uh, grates uh, for accessing the sluice gate. Uh, chains and railings for safety. And again, this is, so the water level that you're seeing here is similar to the water level that would, the rest of the structure would be at um, during fish passage season. So this is, it would be moving faster than this, but this is kind of what you would see. And then, you know, moving further to the end, this is the exit structure. And then the fish uh, pass through this and then out into the pond. The pond is about four and a half acres of spawning habitat. And there's river habitat further upstream. As Anthony said, I think it's about six miles uh, going um, upstream. So the fish will go up here, um, spawn, and the, the adults and the young, well, the adults will go back uh, pretty soon after that, uh, either over the dam or uh, back through the fish structure, the fishway itself. And then the young, as they uh, later in the summer, they will also make that trek back again over, over the dam or back down through the fishway. Um, and just to take another a quick look at from another perspective of how this fishway is set up, we'll go back onto the the sluice gate. So there's the dam, the original barrier through the entrance structure, up the two steep pass units through the concrete channel, and then out into the pond. Alex, um, thank you. 
Uh, sure. Uh, we had a question come through uh, yeah. about the advantage of shutting down the fishway seasonally. Does it save on wear and tear, protect the fish somehow, or, or something else? Why, why do we shut it down? Yeah, so, I mean, you can kind of see even now that there's a bunch of leaves and stuff, but um, if this is open and flowing all the time, it just gets really jammed up with um, sticks and debris and needs to be maintained and cleaned out frequently to keep, it just is a kind of a maintenance issue. Um, also during the winter, you don't want it freezing over and over again. Um, so it's a, an ice, an ice issue. Um, and yeah, that's the, as I understand it, that's the, the reason for leaving it closed. And again, this, this eel pass is functioning all of the time because eel, eel move around a little bit more frequently or more regularly than in a defined season, like the, like, uh, alewife will. So we leave that, um, sort of plugged in through it whenever they want that's great and I, I, just a final point that uh you heard alex mention a couple times the sluice gate um there's another element of you know this site that uh lends itself to the maintenance it lends itself to the construction and he's going to show you right now yeah that's the sluice gate that you see there so these low level outlets below the dam allow for uh better maintenance, uh, they can they can allow for the release of, of any pressure by sort of dropping the water level from safely from down below. Um, so that's another key key aspect of of this site. Yeah, it's uh, it speaks to the availability uh, or the the red the frequent maintenance that's put into this site um, that allows something like this to um, to function. Um, and function well over time so yeah yeah and uh one one last question about this site that's come through which is uh where where the funding came from and uh, i can answer that it was completed uh earlier this year um and uh as far as where that where the funding came from and and uh how much it it cost to do this um, you know, the, the general point on this, I, I believe, uh, funding came through, uh, state funds, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, it was, Anthony, it was, uh, state and NIFWF, uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, and, and yeah, the state DEP funded this project. Great. Yeah. yeah and, and I think one, one thing we always, we always talk about um, with respect to the cost of these projects, which can range a great deal. Um, a project like Page's Mill Pond, uh, that fishway would be uh, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, whereas the one we're going to go to next, the dam removal uh, that's in planning out at Merwin Meadows, dam removals can actually be a lot more complex for, for various reasons. Um, but that one is uh, is going to be in the in the millions of dollars, right? And and it's really <laughs> it's really quite um, it's quite remarkable uh, to think about the the incredible benefits that come out of these projects and and how that uh, that stacks up to those costs that we that we're able to to gather gather investment for. So uh, with that. Thank you for that question, Louis. Louis, uh, one more. Anything else? Okay. No. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate All right. No that. problem. Thanks, Anthony. All right. The last site is uh, just as I just mentioned, Dana Dam, otherwise known as uh, Strong Pond Dam, which is out at Merwin Meadows Park in Wilton, Connecticut, and. Uh, I believe Gwen is out there <laughs> um, at this point. Um, there was some traffic on 95 this morning, but uh, okay. So she's having a little bit of trouble connecting right now, but uh, so I'll, I'll do this overview and we'll see if we can't get, we can't get you a live look at this site. Uh, you know, the good news about that, about that is that, uh, that this site is in planning. So what you see here in this picture, this is the before picture, it's also the current picture because removal has not started. Work has started out at the site, 
uh, as far as doing sediment sampling behind the dam. But for the moment, the dam remains in place and intact. Uh, we are hoping to begin construction uh, on, the, on the removal in 2021. And as I mentioned, this is, a, this is a big project, a very significant project, one that's been prioritized not only by the state DEP, but also by us, by you know, several uh, organizations in the area uh, that, uh, that understand the, the ecological significance of the Norwalk River um, as habitat for migratory fish and also for, for other species that are, are really critical and are indicator species such as brook trout. So the Norwalk River is, is fairly unique uh, in the state of Connecticut in that it's primarily uh, you know, fed by uh, groundwater. And so it's, it's colder than most rivers that we have in the state. And that cold water uh, can mean just better quality habitat for fish. And so while this dam removal, you know, we've been monitoring and, and looking for uh, species like alewife uh, who would use this, uh, this restored habitat as well, there's also a lot of benefits for for other species like brook trout that are indicator species that are often, you know, uh, great fishing, uh, fishing, recreational fishing opportunity. So this project is, is significant from a lot of different uh, perspectives. And you can see in the map over here that it's also significant in the amount of uh, habitat and river miles that it will restore access to for, for migratory fish. So back in 2018, this has all happened sort of, they've, they've been uh, being removed or, or, uh, or mitigated in, in relatively rapid succession here. But in 2018, the flock process dam was removed. That was a project that uh, was led by the Trout Unlimited Mianus chapter, who's a partner uh, on, the, on the Dana Dam removal as well, the Strong Pond Dam removal. Um, and uh, I believe they worked with uh, C uh, Connecticut DEP on that one. The Cannondale Dam upstream of uh, Dana Dam at Merwin Meadows breached actually in 2018, which means that it actually, uh, the water pushed its way through and part of the dam came down or came apart. So the water, uh, it, the, the dam is now passable for fish, for fish migration. So. With the removal of this dam that you see here, fish will now be able to have 17 miles unimpeded from Long Island Sound up to the next barrier on the river, which is Factory Pond Dam. And you can see we're getting relatively close to the headwaters here. So uh, there are uh, fewer and fewer barriers to fish migration on this river as well, which is great news uh, for for the ecology here, for species returning and thriving. So uh, I saw that Gwen is uh, on the line now. So uh, I, very quickly, I do wanna, because this is another one of those projects that has had so many people involved already. And uh, we're very grateful for, for all of our partners. So just to shout a, couple, a few of them out here, we, we mentioned Trout Unlimited Mianus, but Town of Wilton, uh, has been a great partner, the Connecticut uh, Deep Inland Fisheries Division and the Water Planning and Management Division, uh, the Long Island Sound Study, the Connecticut Department of Transportation. Um, there actually is a rail line just on the, on the far side uh, from where this picture was taken that goes really close to the river. And uh, so we've been working with uh, the railroad and with DOT on this project as well to make sure that we're taking into account uh, impact on the resilience of that infrastructure uh, if the dam is removed, if it isn't removed. So, and then also some funders like the New Canaan Community Foundation, the Genium Foundation, and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So with that, uh, I'll send it out to Gwen and we'll see if we can, we can call her up here at the site. Gwen, are you with us out there? All right, let's see if I can. 
There we go. So hopefully folks can see that a little bit. Um, so Gwen is standing right on the, the side of the dam. It is a little blurry, but you can see uh, that is Dana Dam, Strong Pond Dam right there. Uh, it's a 90 foot long dam. That's about six feet high. And uh, as such is, a, is a, just a total barrier to fish migration uh, on the Norwalk River. So uh, there is no other passage here. And uh, you could see the, the flow is fairly low right now. We are in drought, but this, this uh, is a good example for you to see sort of how fish would be attracted to that, to that uh, the flow at the base of the dam and think they can get up, but they can't. This that Gwen's showing you now is the impoundment area behind the dam. Uh, this is where we recently did uh, some sediment sampling with Stantec. Uh, and uh, so when the dam is removed, this will actually re return to uh, sort of its more of its natural flow pattern and will actually uh, direct the river sort of uh, along its, its more natural course away from the train tracks. And, and uh, so it has more of a meander, which can, uh, can slow the flow a little bit and be better for fish passage as well. So I think we, we lost Gwen's video again, but um, that, was, uh, that was Strong Pond Dam, Dana Dam out there in Wilton. What you didn't see uh, is that right behind where Gwen standing, was standing is a, uh, is a uh, walking trail, right? The Norwalk Valley River Trail, I believe it's called. And it's a very well-used recreational path, multi-use recreational path. And, oh, here we go. Gwen's video is back up. So she's walking out to that path now. Um, so that also lent itself to, to a really sort of a high profile and, and really interesting site for us, uh, not only because it means that we can have low impact access to the site to do the removal, but also because uh, people use this site and to have a natural, you know, sort of babbling river there uh, with fish running up uh, and, and some wildlife returning, I think is a really beautiful thing um, for this area. So, uh, yeah, and I see, I, see, uh, I see a question come through too about um, are any of these locations, there's Gwen. <laughs> Hi, Gwen. <laughs> so Gwen's out there in the field. Um, and you could see like, if you walked right past her, that would be right down to, to Dana Dam. So it's, it's a really accessible site. It's a publicly accessible site, um, which is, uh, just makes us, makes us all the more inclined to, to, uh, to work there because we love, we love when, uh, when access to nature can be improved through these projects as well as uh, the fish passage benefits. So uh, there's a question that came through about uh, whether any of these sites are amenable to kayaking or canoeing, and if there's any reasonable portage available down the length of these rivers. Um, I think where certainly where where Gwen is on the on the Norwalk, uh, down below the dam, sort of uh, at its at its natural uh, water level, it would be difficult, if not impossible, since water levels have been so low. Um, at least right now, to, to kayak or, or canoe on this. I would say one river where um, we've done several barrier removal projects and fish passage projects where kayaking canoeing is very popular is the Quinnipiac River. Um, and the Quinnipiac River, uh, you know, the projects that we've done have ranged from Wallingford, Connecticut up to Meriden, Cheshire. So that is a, that's a great opportunity where before you used to have to portage around these dams now and, and barriers now that's, that's very accessible over long stretches uh, on that river. So that's a good one to check out uh, if you're a, a kayaker or a canoeer. All right. So I think uh, with that, I may 
Anthony, this is Rick Huntley. I, I just wanted to comment on Page's Mill Pond. Yeah, Rick. Uh, the uh, Page's or the uh, Farm River, uh, well, well below Page's Mill Pond might be accessible, uh, but specifically Page's Mill Pond Dam being private property, there really is no portage uh, around that uh, fishway uh, and, and the dam in that particular location. Um, yep. There really isn't even fishing access, quite frankly, um, in this particular location. Um, so that's uh, yeah. uh, just something I would point out. That's a great point, uh, Rick, thank you. The other, the other thing I would add is that uh, money for the construction, while administered by the Fish and Wildlife Foundation, actually was uh, quite a bit of EPA money uh, that's really the, the federal source. Um, and then historically, uh, the planning effort was funded also by uh, an EPA grant and then prior fundraising by the Hammond chapter of Trout Unlimited uh, as well. So uh, we have an extensive history, as you mentioned, uh, that it, it took us a long time to get all the planning done. And then thanks to Save the Sound, um, and your ability to um, administer and manage a construction project of the scale uh, that, that this one actually was, uh, uh, was, was really um, uh, how this really got done. So uh, we, we can't thank you enough at, you know, uh, for, for all the work that Save the Sound did to actually get this project uh, brought to completion successfully. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. I, I really, really appreciate that. And I know that uh, we, we actually loved this project and it, and it took, um, it, it was really good for us, I think. Uh, you know, we were working on that project, the Pages Mill Pond Fishway, um, when the pandemic hit. And, you know, the, the ability of all the partners in that project to adapt and, and you know, figure out what that what it would look like to continue that work safely um, uh, was really incredible and speaks to the cooperation, the, the long history of partnership that, that came together to make that project happen in the first place, as you mentioned. Uh, so thank you for your role in that. Uh, there's so many people that, that made that happen, as is, is often the case with these projects. And, um, you know, we were able to get it completed on time and and within budget, and a lot of that credit goes to uh, to Alex and the other construction uh, construction team folks. So uh, we're, we're very grateful to have had that project to you know to bring us out into the field and, and out into nature during COVID. So uh, that was a really important project, and will always be significant to us, I think, in that way. Uh, I want to circle back around. Uh, to the question prior about water quality monitoring and what water quality monitoring is happening at these sites. Um, and I don't know, uh, John, maybe if you wanna speak to that, if John is, yeah. There yeah, is. so to start off with the projects, there's sediment sampling pollution uh, monitoring done so sediment samples are collected at each of the sites and then sent it out to uh, various different labs to see how much and what type of pollutants may be in the soil with that um, depending on the levels and if there's harmful levels which is all federally um, kind of mandated if if there are too high levels the, tr the sediment either has to be trucked out um, or mo most of the times, if it's not uh, over a certain level of the specific pollutant, it can be dealt with on site. Um, so sometimes there's, it's put kind of to the side and planted and made sure that it's not going to leach further into the river. Continual water quality monitoring is not necessarily done at the sites continually. But if there is an issue, like, for example, in the West River, it has been pointed out to us a couple times um, that there was water quality issues. So we have taken water quality samples when issues arise. Uh, at the moment, 
uh, water quality samples continuously gets very expensive, um, especially if you're not targeting a specific pollutant or looking for something. So testing kind of for everything gets really expensive very quickly. So it's more of a of need or a, if there's an issue, then we'll do water quality testing. It is something that we would like to do more of. So if there's potential funding for water quality sampling at all of these dam removal sites and restoration sites, it would be incredible and really interesting data to collect. But at this moment, we only do it at a kind of a problem by problem basis. Uh, besides the preliminary before a project, a dam removal project to see if there are any pollutants stuck in the sediment as well. So that's part of the reason why we do sediment sampling before the dam removals. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks, John. I, I think that's great. And I, I'd also add to that uh, our, uh, our water quality team um, also does a lot of water quality monitoring down at, at, in, the, in the bays and harbors of Long Island Sound. And so a lot of these rivers, um, as they empty out, we're, we're getting a, a, a yearly and annual sense of uh, how the water quality monitoring is trending over time. And you can check that out at uh, soundhealthexplorer.org. Um, <laughs> I looked at Laura, yes, it's dot .org, uh, soundhealthexplorer.org to check out that data over time. That's, that's a really rich data source for that. So we know, we have a sense of the, the various uh, water quality of these rivers as they empty out. And like John said, we respond uh, quickly through Bill Lucy, our soundkeeper, um, and, uh, and other folks on our water quality team, uh, including John uh, is often called upon for these sites um, to go out and address pollution issues that are brought to our attention. So if you know of something, an issue that needs to be addressed, please let us know. And John, uh, is, as, as uh, sort of our, John and Alex as our monitoring team, I know have a lot of wish list items for, for monitoring. So many different types of monitoring that we'd love to be doing. It's just hard to, to, to find funding for that since the funding we get is often for the project itself and the monitoring really begins um, or one part of the monitoring effort begins when that project ends, when the construction is complete. And so when it's done, then we need like, we'd love to see like over years, how the sites are transformed on a variety of different factors. But uh, so we're, we're, we are working on trying to find uh, more funding sources for, for that effort. But thank you for that question. Um, and with that, we are at 11.59, so we'll close out. I want to thank everyone again. I want to thank Alex, Gwen, and John uh, for, for joining us from the field. Thank you, Gwen, especially for sticking in there through the, the tech issues. Uh, being in the field, as we well know, is not always the easiest place to be on technology. Um, so thank you all to the three of you. Thanks to everyone who joined us today on your Saturday on this World Fish Migration Day 2020. We're glad to give you some good news and a look at work that's upcoming to restore passage for these incredibly important uh, migratory fish species. So thank you everyone. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all uh, very soon on either another one of these sessions or hopefully at some point in the relatively near future in person, we'll see. <laughs> but uh, be well and, and take care of yourselves. Thanks everyone.